increase you a thousand times and bless you as he has promised. Why don't you guys welcome our senior pastor, Jim Baker. Did I unmute it here? Are we on? Yeah, that sounds good. How are you guys doing? So sometimes people ask, like, why do you, like, like the Deuteronomy 111, like, isn't that an Old Testament promise? And so some people are like, well, you know, some people think that oh, it's Old Testament, it means it's old, it's done away with. And so the, all the Old Covenant was fulfilled in Jesus, not abolished in Jesus. So here's the thing, all those promises found their fulfillment in Jesus, and now you're in Jesus, so all those promises are fulfilled in you by faith. How are you guys doing? Doesn't mean that there aren't some, that some things have been transformed, like the sacrifices and those things. Those things pointed towards Jesus. Jesus was the promise. But when you begin to read promises made towards Israel, guess what? You are the, it says like Israel is like this olive tree, and you were this wild branch. Now you're grafted into that. So all those promises to Israel are to you too. Does that sound good to anybody? So, so let's read it with a new covenant lens. So the... Um, so this testimony was posted, I think, on the Zion page. It's, uh, someone gave a word of knowledge uh, during a service. So word of knowledge is one of the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12. The Holy Spirit will just kind of highlight something that God wants to, uh, like a condition that God would want to heal. And it said, um, someone had a, uh, the word of knowledge is that someone had a digestive tract issue. And so this person raised their hand. They responded like, yeah, that's me. Uh, she said she saw the uh, Spirit move on me and from head to toe. Forty years ago in Korea, when I was in the military, I got severe food poisoning. Since then, I couldn't eat spicy foods or milk and had stomach lining issues. I was healed and have been good since and tested it with spicy Mexican food and cereal and milk. No problem, praise God. Isn't that good? That's good. All you ice cream lovers said amen to that one, right? Come on. Here's another testimony. So this is uh, from Tori, our office, and they can't find the tumors, and he's cancer-free. Come on. The doctor said chemo wouldn't even work on him, and now he's cancer-free. It's so good. So when we hear, when we hear testimonies, we, we need to feed on these. Okay? Testimonies are to teach you how to see. So if you remember, there was the miracle of the loaves and fishes that Jesus did. Uh, he took uh, some, uh, uh, some, some bread and some fish. He multiplied it. It fed uh, thousands of people. And then uh, there's a couple chapters later, the disciples, they're struggling with the storm, all right? And so Jesus, he's sleeping on the boat. They wake up Jesus. They're freaking out. And um, Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves, this life-threatening storm. He stills it. And then he rebukes the disciples. He rebukes the wind and the waves, and he rebukes the disciples. And he uh, said, you know, uh, because of their unbelief, and he said, for you considered not the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. Isn't that interesting? There was nutrients in the one miracle that was going to give them the faith and the ability to see to go through the next miracle. So guys, when we hear these things, we can't just golf clap it. Oh, wow, well, cancer healed. Awesome. We need to feed ourselves on these things. So we, we, remember this, guys. God is no respecter of people. I know we, we, that's a phrase that maybe is common to you, but we can't get it. If God will heal one person because of what Jesus has done, he'll heal another person because of what Jesus has done. Remember, God's not going to withhold healing from you because you're bad. I got good news for you. If you're, a, if you're an ISIS today, you qualify because of what Jesus has done if you get your eyes on Jesus. Yeah. You don't have to clean up your address as much as he loves the apostle. And when, one, yeah. when one terrorist named Saul encountered the love of God, he became the apostle Paul. So God will not withhold healing from you because you're bad. He's not going to heal you because you're good. He's going to heal you because of what Jesus did on the cross. So as believers today, we're pushing our chips to the center of the table that what Jesus did on the cross is what qualifies us. Old Covenant preaching is going to disqualify you and tell you you need to do more and work harder. Oh, here's, here's all these conditions you have to meet. New Covenant preaching is going to qualify you for the promises of God because of what Jesus has already done. Okay, so that's a good way to test it. Well, we had a guy who came to the church, and he had a, um, he had a horn. I'm glad. I, 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 I'm not encouraging any of this behavior. But he said he would go to churches, and he would hear them mix in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. He would honk the horn during the service. And so... Uh, he doesn't go here anymore, but uh, he said he was thankful that he never had to honk the horn here. So I'm, I'm also thankful. I think that would be, that, that would be embarrassing a little bit. You know, so I don't know. People like that clown, noise, no, clown nose noise. All right, you guys good? So we're going to continue a series called Heal Like Jesus. And I feel like, man, there's some really good things shifting. Like we're seeing like miracles and even notable miracles. I mean, last week we had that autism healing that we read about, and um, yeah, just yay God, awesome things. And so I did a miracle, I did a miracle, I did a sermon. <laughs> it's a miracle, I did a sermon. 
and uh, it was part. It was this summer. And it was called "Birthing Your Miracle," and it basically just stole it from Andrew Walmack and gave it to you guys. I admitted it though, but it, but he gave us a really important truth in there that your mind is like a, a spiritual womb, and we looked at some um, passages that talked about that and how the word of God is like a seed. And so when that seed of the word of God gets in the womb of your imagination, it begins to conceive. And so there's, there's times when you need to see the miracle on the inside before you see it on the outside. And so the reason that we're doing this series, uh, Heal Like Jesus, is we're learning how to do healing the way Jesus did. Like you have an opportunity to be mentored by Jesus in healing. You don't want to be mentored by me, by John G. Lake, by any, any, any other person. Like I just put myself on the same level as John G. Lake, didn't I? I didn't mean it like that. You don't want to be mentored by any mere human. Okay, you want to be mentored by Jesus himself. He was the best at He healed every person who came to him and every person the Father led him to. I want you guys to get that. He only, when you're seeing Jesus, you're seeing God in action. It's as if God is extending himself through Jesus and you're seeing what the Father's like and he's healing every person who came to him and every person that the Father led him to. And so we begin to, so we know the will of God. And so how did the disciples learn how to do healing? Well, they didn't come to my healing training on a Saturday, although I highly suggest that that'll be good. What they do? They looked at how Jesus did it, and they learned it from him. And so in these stories, there's 26 different miracle stories in Jesus. There's healing of the multitudes, but as far as individual accounts, so we're trying to look at them in chronological order the best we can. I don't know if we're going to go through all 26, but we're, uh, we're having fun. There's lessons to be learned, but we're, we're learning from it. And I want you to see, we're not just observing it and like, oh, this is interesting. Let's have an intellectual discussion. No, we're, we're, lear- we're, we're getting it into our imaginations. That's why I'm giving you the scripture sheets. That's why I'm taking time to kind of help us paint a picture in our head is because you know that you've been unique as if we could do the very same things because we have the same relationship with the father that Jesus has. We're adopted as his children. And now uh, we can be completely dependent upon the Holy Spirit as Jesus was. Okay. And so we have the same access. Remember, Jesus didn't didn't just do these things as God. Jesus never stopped being God, but it said he set aside those privileges of divinity and exercised it as a man. And so, uh, I mean, if we were watching it as God, we'd be like, man, that's incredible. Like, wow, yay, God, that's amazing. But we would never think that we could do it. But now we're learning, we're watching it, we're seeing Jesus of Nazareth. How Je- you know, the, the Jesus as the man, empowered by the Holy Spirit, is doing these things. Now we have a responsibility to emulate his lifestyle. We have that relationship, now we're going to learn how to do it like he does. Are you guys seeing the picture? All right, so we're, we're painting these things in our imagination. Today we're going to look at the story of the leper. I love this story. Um, I'm, I'm probably not going to have a story. I'm like, I hate this story. I'm, but I really, I like this one a lot. And so uh, this story is told in Matthew chapter 8, Mark chapter 1, and Luke chapter 5. And so again, so there's, there's something called the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books of the New Testament. And there were different followers of Jesus, and they were looking at the story, and each one will bring out different things. You'll see Luke, the medical doctor, he's always going to give us a little bit more medical information, so interesting stuff. So let's look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. When Jesus, when he came down from the mountain, speaking of Jesus, when he came down from the mountain, so this is Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 was Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. So he's just delivered the Sermon on the Mount, and now he's coming down the mountain. And they're, they're marveling at the authority that Jesus is teaching with. Now he's going to come down and demonstrate it. When Jesus came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. All right, so let's, uh, let's go through this story. Let's start again in verse 1, Matthew chapter 8. And behold, a leper came to him. Now, wonder, I want you to see uh, the, the word behold. It's like, take a look at this. Like, what in the world is this doing here? Imagine the shock of someone with a MAGA hat showing up to an Antifa meeting. Oh, God. <laughs> are, you seeing the, are you seeing, like, what on earth is this person doing here? They don't belong here. That's behold, a leper. What is this leper doing here? They're not allowed anywhere near people in society, let alone this rabbi. Okay? Let me tell you a few things about leprosy in the days of Jesus. A leper was incurable, okay? They were known as the walking dead. And so they were not only incurable, but they were untouchable, okay? People, uh, we're going to get to the history of it here. But there was two kinds of lepers. The first kind of leprosy was mostly ulcers, okay? So there'd be ulcers, these, these you know, perforations in the skin, their skin's uh, getting eaten away. It would begin on their face, and then their hair begins to fall out, so the leper begins to, uh, eventually is bald, and then they have no hair in their body. Then the ulcers begin to get into their voice box, 
And so the voice becomes raspy and grating. And when they speak, it would almost be like how a robot sounds today. Finally, ulcers, they spread through their whole body. And now they're just one mass of oozing sores, head to toe, front to back. Now, the other kind of leprosy was a loss of sensation in the nerve endings. And so this is where they could put their hand in a fire. They could get damage in it. The, the limbs begin to fall off. They would hurt their foot. They would get an infection. And limbs began to fall off because they just simply lost the nerve. And uh, sometimes these two conditions would find themselves in one person. This is a, a, a horrible condition to be in. Um, uh, in condition number two, the tendons begin to shrink, so their hands become like bird claws. Uh, there's the ulceration, the dropping off of the limbs, and it's just a terrible sight. And so in Leviticus 13, they actually had a law on how lepers were to be treated. So here's the, here's, the, here's the law of the leper. His clothes shall be torn. The hair on his head would be uncovered. His, uh, his, the cover, uh, he shall cover his upper lip as he approaches people, and he shall cry, unclean, unclean. And he shall live alone, and his dwelling shall be outside the camp. Okay? They catch the leprosy. But also, under the old covenant law, God had already been revealed himself as healer. Okay, it had already been revealed himself as here. So it was also a cry for prayer. So when they're, cl- when they're crying unclean, they're recognizing, like, keep away so you don't get this, but pray for me so that I can receive healing. Okay, so originally this is, this is something, you know, this is, yeah, this, this is something compassionate. So why do they have to wear the torn clothes? Why the disheveled hair? Why did he have to cover up his lip? Because this is what a mourner did in the Bible. Okay, and so when you're going to a funeral, uh, if you approach the disease, you, you would tear your clothes in an act of grief, right? You would, you would dishevel your hair. And so the leper, they were dressed as a mourner because it was a living illustration. They were on their way to their own funeral. That's why they were called the walking dead. And so they're announcing, I'm a dead man. I'm living, but I'm dead. I'm on my way to my own funeral. And so pray for me. Don't catch this thing and pray for me. So Leviticus 13 gives us those laws. But look at the beauty. The next chapter is Leviticus 14. Once they're healed, here's how you're to receive them back into society. The very next chapter. Okay, so it wasn't that there were these disgusting, unbelievable people. It was an act of compassion biblically. We're going to see that it got twisted here. But uh, Leviticus 14 is full of measures that makes the, um, make sure that they're, uh, once the leper is cleansed, that they're ceremonial clean. Now they can be brought back into worship, be brought, in a, be brought back into society. Isn't that beautiful? Here's this act of compassion. Here's what you do with an expectation of them getting healed. Okay, so that's the Bible. How many of you know religion can take something beautiful in the Bible and begin to twist it? How many of you know religion can make you stupid? Some of the things you're like, you have to be stupid to believe some of these things. And religion will help you be stupid. You can, you can quote that one if you want. So, so, um, so by the time Jesus comes on the scene, the, ra- the rabbis in the synagogue, they've taken the compassion of Levit- Leviticus and twisted it into something very cruel. And it's very, very something demented. So the word unclean, when so- they cried out unclean, it was no longer looked upon as a cry for help. Okay, it was no longer a warning that I'm infected, please pray for me. It come to mean that I, in my innermost being, I'm unclean. I am morally defiled. I am spiritually dead. Avoid me because the curse of God is upon me. Upon me. I am one under God's punishment. If you remember um, uh, back in the early days of AIDS, what did people say? This is the curse of God. These people are absolutely disgusting. Does anyone remember the early 80s? Right? I mean, everyone's afraid of that thing. You know, just, I got some good news for you. God's not judging people right now. He already judged Jesus. Okay? Just in case you think God's in a bad mood, he's not in a bad mood. Okay, I don't have time to explain this. We've got whole messages on this. But there will be a judgment at the end of time, and you'll be dealt with based on how you dealt with Jesus. If you, if you, if you, if you receive Jesus, you'll be rewarded. If you did not receive Jesus, you'll go to a place where you don't have to worry about God because he won't be there. Okay, He's not going to force himself on you. See, in heaven, God's everywhere. You can't escape him. And so it would actually be very cruel for you to go to heaven hating God because you wouldn't be able to escape him. Okay, So he puts you, so he puts you in a place... Where, I got some good news for you. God's not up there angry at you. But I don't know who's listening to this morning. This isn't even in the notes. Somebody needs to hear this. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what religion has made you feel disgusting. I don't know if you've had an abortion, you've been raped, if you've got things in your past that you're not proud of. You are not disgusting to God. That is religion that twists it. Okay? God's not up there angry at you. All right? He has already poured out all of his wrath upon sin. His son became sin. He took upon, uh, his, uh, Jesus took upon all that wrath. So now all God has for you is grace and peace and love. Um, about, I'm about to name drop here. Um, 
Uh, we were with Heidi Baker last week, and so, oh, wow. Anyway. anyway, and so she's sharing about how, I mean, it was horrible how um, uh, the Muslims, I'm not saying all Muslims are like this, but the ones where she's at are, are doing this. They're coming in, uh, within 20 minutes of their camp, they were chopping up their, they were killing their pastors and chopping up their family members into little pieces. And so she came in very heavy that morning, obviously. And so, um, and it was interesting because she began to say, you know, God, give me a heart for the people who are chopping them up, for the Muslims. I want you guys to see God, those are God's children too. God loves Donald Trump as much as he does Nancy Pelosi, as much as he does Joe Biden, as much as he does Ben Shapiro. Are, are we okay here? All right. All right. What would it look like if the church began to love people like that? Yeah, there's this, there's this religious thing that says if you're not standing up blasting sinners every single week from the pulpit, then you're not preaching the gospel. Guys, that's not good news. The good news is not how bad sin is. Stop being shocked that sinners are sinning. It's in, the, it's in their job description. And so, uh, yeah. Well, it's interesting. Jesus was hard on religious hypocrites and loving towards sinners. Somehow the church has reversed this so that we tolerate religious hypocrisy and that we're hard on, on sinners. Just go let, check your last 10 Facebook posts and see if you need to delete something. Or maybe you need to unfollow some people. Or maybe you need to stop arguing with some people. Has anyone ever uh, just uh, really had someone have a change of heart with a Facebook argument? Isn't that just such a beautiful thing? I don't, I don't argue anymore. I just ban people, and it feels great. So, I love it. A little dopamine rush. Ban. And so the religious of the day began to say God's leprosy was, uh, your leprosy is God's punishment upon you. It's his judgment upon you. And if you'll endure it until you die, you'll be forgiven because then God will have given up his judgment on you. And so they just endured it. They were, they were the despised of God, according to them. It's interesting. And, if you, and they said if you touch a leper, whether it's accidentally or on purpose, you become as disgusting and unclean as that leper. I mean, talk about cooties to the extreme. I mean, it's just horrible. So then the rabbis begin to say, okay, if this is true, if you touch this leper, they're unclean and you become unclean, then we need to put a whole bunch of rules around it. So here's some of the new rules. Um, if a leper put his head inside the door of your house, your house was pronounced as unclean as the leper. If the leper was near people at all, he was not allowed to come any closer than six feet. Isn't that interesting? Religious had uh, six foot social distancing way before we did. <laughs> How we doing? If the wind was blowing from behind the leopard, you had to, he had to stand 150 feet away from you. I'm not sure how they come up with these numbers. I'm not sure how they do that, but that's what they did. It was illegal to say good morning to a leper. It was illegal, uh, it was against the law for a leper to enter into a conversation. If a, okay, I, I want, are you seeing behold the leper, how shocking it is that this guy is here now? Okay, because Jesus was a rabbi. Here's what, they, here's what they said. If a leper approached a rabbi, the rabbi would throw stones and sick the dogs on him. Some rabbis would not buy food from the street in which the leper had walked. Boy, we got, yeah, it's shocking. We got Christians today who don't even want to go into a non-Christian bookstore because they might get some kind of spiritual cooties. They're so afraid of becoming unclean. I got some good news for you. Light is stronger than darkness. You don't need to be worried about some witch who shakes your hand or some sinner who has some spiritual cooties for you or whatever, guys. Man, just release something good. If I'm around a witch, I'm going to be releasing something on the inside. I'm going to be intentional about it, but I'm not going to be afraid. They need to be afraid. So you can see that this leper, he's not only physically ill, he's an outcast. All right, he has, he's not only lost his health, he's lost his home, he's lost his family, he's lost his dignity, he's lost his hope, he's lost his name, any business he may have had, he's lost that. Are you, are you guys getting the picture? Religion had turned this person who was physically ill, who needed mercy, into a complete outclass, cast morally, spiritually filthy, and this dirty leper. And the rabbi said that a leper was not allowed in Jerusalem. He was not allowed into a big city that had walls. So he had to stay on the outskirts of the city yelling, I'm unclean, please pray for me. Can you just feel the horror of this disease? 
All right, because it wasn't just a disease. He had a personal sense of his own guilt. He must have done something to deserve this. And so the rabbis would debate what kind of sins this person must have, uh, a leper must have committed to have God's judgment come on them. So, so it affected him not only physically, but emotionally and mentally. Okay? And so we read, it, we read it very quickly. Behold, a leper. But I want you to see what's behind this. Their jaws were on the ground. What is this leper doing? It's like, it's like a Michigan Wolverine fan at an OSU tailgate party. It's like, what? It... <laughs> now, if you remember, uh, Luke was a doctor. Luke wrote the book of Luke, and he wrote the book of Acts. He was a medical doctor. In his account, Luke 5, he gives a little bit more of the medical description in verse 12. Uh, while he, this is Jesus, while Jesus was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. Okay, this is a medical term used to describe someone who's in the advanced stages of leprosy. Uh, another a translation says he was covered in leprosy, okay? His leprosy head to toe, front to back. This guy is terminal, and he's almost at the end of his life. So I mean, you can almost see this person almost probably, I mean, I'm not trying to be mean, probably looks like a science fiction monster with, with the bird claws and the raspy voice and the no hair and the ulcers all over the body. And he comes up, and here comes this untouchable, and the crowd sees them, and they are, obviously, they're scattering. They are gone. And I, you just have to ask the question, how on earth did this guy get here? Okay, Luke's account says in verse 12, while Jesus was in one of the cities, lepers weren't even allowed in the cities. So how, how is this guy getting here? Okay, how did he get within six feet of Jesus? I mean, this guy is like breaking all the protocols. How did he even hear something about Jesus? I mean, every other rabbi, get out the stones, get out the dog, sick him on him, Right? So, but I mean, it's not like you could sit down and have a conversation with a leper and tell him about all the wonderful things of Jesus. But he's hearing these little fragments of information. He's hearing these little scraps of information, these little rumors about what Jesus is like. And he hears enough in these rumors to say, you know what, there's something different about this Jesus. Okay? And so, because nobody's talking to these lepers, but this one, he's not like religion. And so this guy makes a gamble. Okay? He's going he's gonna, he's gonna to break all these protocols. He's going into the city. He's getting within six feet. He's initiating a conversation here. Okay? Luke 5.12 uh, while he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy, and when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if, you're will, it, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And so, uh, so just based on these scattered reports, he recognizes this Jesus, he's more than just a man, because it says he fell on his face. It said he knelt before Jesus. Another translation says he bowed down. The word there, it means worship. And the word worship is used for worship of God alone. So this leper, whatever little scraps of information he has, he puts them together and paints this picture, falls on his face, and the first words out of his mouth are Lord, right? And so th this guy, his faith in the power of Jesus is absolutely incredible. I mean, the, the, what, the, the nerve he had, I mean, he could be facing death. He could be stoned to death for these things. He's got faith and expectancy. Jesus, you can make me clean, okay? He's saying these ulcers, these claw hands, the, the deformities, the missing limbs. You can make me a normal human again. You can dismiss these altars. You can straighten out my hands. You can heal my leprosy. You can, you can, you can, right? I love this. He's incredible. This is incredible, this expectancy he has. But the problem was, he says, I know you can. I'm just not sure you're willing. Guys, this is where most of the church is today. I mean, on an exam, no one's going to say, I don't think God can do it. I think he's, he's a little too old. He's kind of lost his juice. No, like, no one's thinking God can't do it. But a lot of them just picture him up with their arm, his arms folded up there. He's not willing. So now we've got to get into religion and do something to make him willing. Like the prophets of Baal cutting themselves. We're not cutting ourselves, but we're fasting. We're crying out. We're trying to tie their way to God's righteousness. We may not be cutting ourselves, but we're still trying to do things to get God's attention so that he will. Oh, he can, but for some reason, he's just not willing to do it for me. How are we doing? Good. So here comes this leper. He's daring to kneel before Jesus. He's breaking the six-foot barrier. He's daring to be thrown in jail by the authorities because he's not supposed to be here. Too many people around him, not even supposed to be in the city. He's risking it all because he knows that Jesus can heal him, but his gamble is, is he willing to? Is he willing to? I love this part. If you're willing, you can make me clean. That's his dilemma. And so, it's interesting. This is the only time the willingness of God was challenged in the entire New Testament. And I get why. I mean, this guy's a leper. He's been cursed. He's been tossed aside. Religion's just treated this person terrible. I can understand why. But isn't it interesting? The people who are around Jesus, um, who saw him for what he was really like, they never questioned his willingness. Guys, we have to, I, I, what I want, one of the things I want us to get out of this story is I want the willingness of God to heal you 
and to heal anybody you're praying for, to burn in the fiber of your being. Guys, we can't just keep talking about this week after week. We have to have it on the inside. That's what I'm saying. Let's take these things. Let's let God paint a picture on the inside. Let's hear the words of Jesus. I am willing. I'm gonna, I'm, we're going to see how he said it in a moment. That's interesting. But I believe uh, uh, many believers secretly have the same problem as the leper. Okay? They have the same problem as the leper. They, uh, they don't question God's ability to heal, but they're wondering about his willingness to do it for them. So where does that question come from today? Okay, I know where it came from back then. This guy, you've been treated bad by religion, but how do we get there today? How do we have so many people in the church who are wondering, you know, and they pray that stupid prayer, Lord, if it be that will. Now, it's not a stupid prayer if you're praying it according to James chapter 4, which was the original context of if it be our will. He says, don't, go into, don't move to a new city and make plans and then say, Lord, if it be your will. He's talking about don't make plans without God, okay? That's what it's talking about. It's not talking about God clearly revealing his will, and then you're going, well, I don't know, God. Is that your will? It's clearly the will of God for healing. You don't need to pray if it be thy will. If you're praying if it be thy will, you're already in unbelief. You can't pray in faith if you don't even know that God's agreeing with you. Right. Oh, I kind of hope so. Well, that's, uh, it's faith that moves not mountains, not hope that moves mountains. So where did that question come from? Okay, like, I, I know you can, but are you willing? All right? So, number one, I think it just comes from a, a lack of the, the a revelation of the greatness of God's unconditional love for us. Listen, guys, I mean, Jesus makes it real simple. If you fathers being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your Father in heaven delights in giving good gifts. Guys, here's just a real simple thing. If a good dad wouldn't do it, a heavenly Father wouldn't do it. Okay, you know, I'm a good dad. I would not put sickness on my children. If I did, I'd be arrested for child abuse. And to think that God the Father is somehow putting sickness on his obedient children is really disgusting. Especially when we see Jesus perfectly modeling the, real, the will of God, and he never put sickness on anybody. He healed every person who came to him. Let this burn in your spirit. There's nothing you can do to deserve healing. There's nothing you can do to undeserve the healing. Guys, I've watched person after person who are not believers get healed. Jesus didn't even make them join the team first. If they simply heard good news, had a mustard seed of expectation, or maybe they were just in neutral and the person praying for them had a mustard seed, good things happen in their life. I, I, I'm not going to make this declaration of our church, but it's almost easier to get unbelievers healed because they don't have all the religious stupidity to undo. All the fear, doubt, and unbelief that we're still trying to get hold of. Oh, what about Joe? What about Paul's thorn in the flesh? And, you know... We dealt with all those in previous messages, but God showers you with blessing, not because of your track record, but because of the track record of Jesus. I think I used this illustration multiple times. When our kids were small, they would come to us with their report cards, and we would reward them for all A's. With B's, they got nothing, okay? And C's, they had to pay us. Anyway, that was the Baker household. Really, that's how it worked. And so um, they did really good, though. And so... Um, yeah, it's, but a lot of people are coming to God, waiting to be rewarded for the report card. And there's so many people come to me, Jim, I fasted, I've prayed, I went to this conference, I did this. I'm like, you just told me the problem. All of your focus is on what you did. That's self-righteousness. See, faith doesn't focus on what you do, that's entitlement. I deserve this because I've done this. I've been meditating on the scriptures. I've been this and that. Well, you ain't perfect. And that's the standard for self-righteousness. And in the new covenant, we're coming with Jesus' report card. And now God delights to reward you as if you were Jesus himself. It's good news. The law says, I will carry my end, and I will bless you if you carry your end. But if you fail, I will curse you. Everybody say boo to the Old Testament law. But now the old covenant was made obsolete. There's a new arrangement. Okay, it's been, okay. There's, a, there's been a new arrangement between God and man. Under the new covenant, God says, I will carry my end. And then I will come and carry your end, and I will treat you as if you carried your end yourself. That's grace. That's the new covenant. When we feel unimportant, God, God can heal, but I'm insignificant. My faith is weak. I haven't done enough to deserve healing. I don't know enough about all this healing stuff to get healed. I've prayed, been prayed for so many times, I've been disappointed. I'm not going to bother God with this stuff. My stuff's too little. When you believe these lies, you're showing you don't understand that unconditional love of God. Just hang around old faithful, and you'll see that he's faithful. As you just begin to get around him, as you begin to see the person of Jesus, you'll see the kind of love. And now you need to know, you know what? You need to know it by experience. 
Okay, that's one of the good things about coming to a church that, that believes in the gifts of the Spirit and the power of God and the presence of God. Is it says the Holy Spirit sheds abroad the love of God in your heart. It's the difference between studying kissing and having a big, wet, sloppy kiss. It's the, it's the difference between the theology and the philosophy of laughter and having a big belly laugh. Okay? Some of you, uh, you just need the experience of God's love. And so, yeah, just, let's just keep our eyes on Jesus. I'm going to pray for that at the end. We'll, we'll do that. And so, um, so, uh, so when did the church stop believing in the willingness of God to heal? Because obviously in the New Testament, it's, there's only one guy who had it. So when did it happen? So here's what was going on. So it started around the 4th or 5th century. So, uh, you know, the 1st, you know, 2nd, 3rd, and early 4th century, there was a lot of martyrs. People were being persecuted for the faith and being put to death. But pretty soon, the persecutors all got saved. So they're not hunting down Christians anymore. And so the Bible would talk about you can receive a martyr's crown. There's a special crown for uh, giving of your life for the faith, the faith of Jesus. And so people began to desire that. They actually had people who were leaping out of the stands to be martyred so they, could, they, could, they were the heroes of the faith. Okay? But now there's no more martyrs. And so gradually, 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 they began to get this stupid teaching in the church that says... Um, I said, that, okay, but since there's no more martyrs, if you will have a sickness and you will carry it as unto the Lord and you die of that disease, it is as if you are martyred. Okay? And so they began to say things like this. This is my cross to bear. That's a lie from the pit of hell. This is my thorn in the flesh. We already looked at it, guys. Paul's thorn in the flesh was demonic persecution at the hands of men. It wasn't bad eyesight. We already looked at all that. So... I'm going to make a powerful statement for you, and I'm going to have you guys meditate on this. You guys ready for this? Blaming God for someone's sickness is like blaming a giraffe for your food being burnt. They have nothing to do with each other. His name is healer, not afflictor. Steal, kill, and destroy is someone else's job description. So let's not get this stupid religion that's like, oh, if I bear this. And I remember, um, I think I got this illustration somewhere in there. Oh, yeah. So I was at this funeral here in Columbus, and it wasn't for our church. It was for someone else. And uh, it, was, it was an uncomfortable situation. So the, 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 there was um, a child who had passed away early, and uh, there was probably 1,500 people at this funeral. It was, it was kind of a little bit of a public funeral. And um, so they asked, the, the family said, listen, we're, we're going after healing. Can you come up and just give a word of encouragement that this wasn't God's fault? So I get up there. I gave like a little five-minute deal. And uh, I think they had six pastors, other pastors speak. So it was, it was a long funeral, it was like three or four hours. And, um, and so, I, so, the, so I get up there. I'm sitting on the front row. Um, I stuck out. I was the only white guy in the room. And so they, uh, anyway, and so, they, uh, so I get there. So the, someone else gets up there, and he says, oh, we're going to have to correct the zealousness of the young pastor. This was years ago, back when I was considered young. And so I began to teach the opposite of me. And so I was like, all right, this is low-level persecution. I'm not getting stripes on my back. This is no big deal, but he's making me look like, like an idiot. And then uh, the next guy gets up there, and he's in a wheelchair, and he's got crutches in his, in his hand, too. So apparently he could probably walk a little bit. He had cancer. It's eating through his bones. And I wrote down this quote. He says, don't tell me this sickness is from Satan. God gave me this sickness for his glory. Raised up his crutch, and everyone began to cheer. It took everything within me to not yell, then why are you going to the doctor to get rid of it? Why not ask for a double portion? I'm like, Jim, that's stupid. Why, why, would, why would you ask for more sickness? Exactly. Religion makes you stupid. Religion begins to say that this is for the glory of God. It's not for the glory of God. When you're healed, it'll be for the glory of God. And if you're not healed, you'll enter into the glory of God as a believer. It'll all be restored there. Sometimes we just don't see it all here. We're still working on that. But let's not change the theology and point the finger at God and say, you're doing this. I'm going to ask you, I don't know what your background is. I don't know if you're watching online. This is the first time you're hearing about healing. Hearing about healing. But I want you to renounce every such thought of God's unwillingness, of you having to earn it. And I want you to hear what Jesus responded. I am willing. Be clean. Remember, when we're, when we're looking at Jesus, God is extending himself through Jesus, and we're hearing the heart of the Father. Here's Jesus, God in the flesh, and here's this, Jesus is looking at this person, and he's not seeing his will be done. He's looking at this leper. He's looking at this body that's being decayed, and this is not the will of God. And Mark chapter 1 says, Jesus was moved with compassion. 
Now, compassion is an old word. It took place before the New Testament. And when the pagans would make sacrifices, they would cut open an animal, and they would bring, I'm going to read this to you, the intestines, the liver, and the kidneys, basically the guts. And they would hold it up, and they would call it the compassion. The idea is they're taking all of your insides, right? And so the, 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 the word kind of got adopted into the New Testament. So here's the picture of the compassion. is It's like this holy love and this holy anger. It's like you're being torn apart on the inside, and I have to be moved to do something about it. See, compassion doesn't go, oh, man, leprosy, that's got to be horrible. And oh, the, the, the social outcast, I feel so bad. That's sympathy that says, I feel bad for you, and I'm going to leave you in your condition. Compassion can never just leave you in the condition. Compassion is moved. It's taking you, and you can just feel it on your inside, like this is wrong. This is not the way it's supposed to be. It's this combination of love and anger. And Jesus was moved with compassion, uh, Mark 141, here's how the New International in the NIV translated it. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. You, there, there's a tinge of anger to it. It's almost like he stomped his foot. And it's like, you know, how could you think? Any, I, I love um, uh, J.B. Phillips that says, of course I want to be clean. This isn't just some religious, I am willing, be thou made whole. We can just read these stories as if Jesus is just some unemotional, detached rabbi who's just going through, very sanitary. See this scene. I mean, you can, this guy, he's breaking all the protocols. People are scattering. He's breaking the six-inch rule or six-foot rule. And Jesus is like almost, of course I want to. How dare you think anything else? That was Jesus' response to the only time he was ever questioned concerning his willingness. I want you to let the willingness of God possess you. Okay, that you cannot see a sick person without hearing Jesus say, I am willing. I want to. Never pray, again pray about sickness, if it be thy will. Jesus perfectly revealed the will of God and showed us he healed every person. So to those in, in, who are in here and you've been named by a doctor, AIDS, arthritis, Alzheimer's, I just kind of gave a bunch of A's there, alcoholism, uh, go all the way A to Z. When you have a name, that's your boundary. It limits your hope and expectation, okay? This is what you must now expect, because the doctors are the final authority on earth. No, they're not, okay? Like the leper going through the last stages of leprosy, I want you to hear whatever you've been named with, I am willing, be clean. And then we read Jesus. After he says this, it says, Jesus stretched out his hand. Remember the leper, he's afraid to break the six-foot barrier, okay? So apparently Jesus has to come to him a little bit farther. Jesus stretched out his hand, and touched him. Now you realize Jesus has broken every law in the book. He's, he's having a conversation with this guy. He's getting closer to him. He's touching this guy now. And um, I, mean, he's, I mean, this guy's like, imagine like a yellow hazmat suit that's radioactive. Like everybody's staying away from it. I mean, you see the shock. I mean, we just get a couple sentences here. And you see the shock. Their jaws are on the ground, like gasp. He's talking to this leper. Gasp, he's moving. What's he, what's he about to do? Oh, my. Can you just see it? Remember Monster Zinc? We got a 2319. We got a 2319. <laughs> Remember the sock and the monster and, yeah, the whole thing. So they're standing there bug-eyed. Their jaws dropped as he talks to this leper. You can hear the gasps that go across the crowd as he begins to touch this leper. And he touched the leper, and he says, I am willing. So he touches the leper. He's demonstrating the... Look, guys, he didn't have to touch the leper. There's so many times he just sent the word. So many times he did this. This would have been the first touch this guy had received in years. So what is Jesus doing? He's, uh, he's showing him the love of God. He's, he's expressing that compassion that he was moved with. Then he changes his theology, I am willing. And then he releases that healing word, be made whole. Isn't that good? So here's the person of the human race, Jesus Christ, representing of all humanity, and he touches him and says, son, you're home. You can be touched now. You're no longer an outcast. You're no longer alone. Me touching you means that from now on, you can mend relationships, you can return to society. I accept you. You're not cursed, my friend. And there's so many times we have like a head-heart, a head-hand connection. We're typing with our hands, we're doing stuff with our hands. But when you're praying for the sick, it's a hand-heart connection. It's an extension of that compassion, and you're coming forward. It's never just this, you know, I'm just laying hands on this. It's a, it's a head, I'm sorry, it's a heart-hand connection. And Jesus extends that, and he's restoring this guy. It's interesting, in the Old Testament, if you touched a leper, you became unclean. Now under the New Testament, like how Bill Johnson says, that when we touch a leper, they become clean. 
Why? Because the healing energy, the healing power, healing himself, Jesus Christ, is living on the inside of us, and we're extending that compassion. I love how Matthew reports it. Jesus just says, be cleansed. And Matthew says, immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Luke says his leprosy left him. Can you imagine this body that's filled with these running, oozing sores, the shriveled hands, all this? It just evaporates. His skin is baby. His hands begin to straighten out. I remember we were at a church, and uh, we were doing a healing night, and we prayed for this little boy. And I was probably 10 or 11 years old, and, um, and he had spots all over his body. And the kids at school called him the leopard, okay? And so you can imagine how cruel kids are. And he just had these dark spots all over his body. He had on shorts and a T-shirt. And so I remember we prayed for him, and uh, the spots disappeared whew, just like that. Uh, and then uh, he saw them disappearing, and he's gasping, and he pulls up his shirt. And it was like, it was almost like, a sh- like the sun hitting a shadow, you know, and it just disappeared. The spots whew, just went right out of his body like that. His mom falls on his knees, and this is interesting. She says, this will change his life. Why? Because there was a stigma. There was something associated with being different that was being made fun of, and now he is being brought in. And so here's Jesus with this person who has this stigma, who hadn't been touched, who hadn't been able to see his family, touches him, changes his theology, I am willing, speaks the healing word, changes this man's life. That's good. So what do we learn from this miracle? Are we doing okay? We need to learn to live in that phrase, I am willing. Let it hit every fiber of your being. You can look into those eyes of people who are hopeless, who are terminal, who are frightened, those who wonder if God cares enough to heal, and you can hear Jesus say, I am willing, be clean. For those of you who pray for the sick, and if that's not you, you hang around here long enough, that will be you. Um, You never have to wonder if it's God's will to heal. Whenever you have someone standing in front of you, you can hear those words ring over you, and you know exactly the heart of God for that person every single time. Before we just say a quick amen and, and close here, how is Jesus here today and how is he healed today? He's at the right hand of the Father, he's the head of the body, and we are his body. God is not up there on a case by case basis deciding whether or not someone's worthy to be healed. He's healing through his body, he's healing through his hands and feet, which means if you and I don't step out and pray for somebody, it ain't going to happen. He's not just floating around and the angels are just going and there, there's a spiritual lottery and people are just getting it. And He's not in a galaxy far, far away. He's inside of you. You know, when you're in a foreign country and they have an American embassy, uh, once you step over that threshold, you are in America. You are under all the laws of America, okay? You are an ambassador of a different world. You are an ambassador of heaven is one of the uh, titles that you get in the New Testament. So when someone comes into your embassy, comes into your area, they are now subject to a different set of laws. I want you guys to get that. When they step in and you say, hey, can I pray for you? And they say, sure. They've just agreed to a different set of laws. And you've got the willingness of God. And you've got the, the energy, the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you because you've been united to Jesus, because of his cross, not because of your amazingness. We're putting it all in God, what you have done. And now I'm just being obedient. You said lay hands on the sick and they would recover. They've stepped into a whole different, a whole different embassy. Guys, you're not an audience, you're an army. These are not things that we just sit here and listen to and applaud and agree with. No, no, no. We're, we're, in, in the person of Jesus, we're seeing what we can now do. The Bible's not a book of rules. Here's what you have to do now. It's a book of our inheritance. Here's what you can now do. How many of you guys remember um, the greatest American hero, Ralph Hinckley? Believe it or not, I'm walking on air. Awesome show. I think they should redo it and have Owen Wilson be the guy. But anyway, and Bruce Campbell be the the agent from the FBI. Anyway, so um, he got this amazing super suit uh, from these aliens came and gave it to him. It wasn't a documentary. It's, 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 It's a comedy show. And so he got, he got this amazing super suit and had this book of instructions with it. And so the first thing he did was shrink down. He's like, man, I got these shrinking powers. And then he read how to shrink back up, but he put the book down on the ground. So he, now he's big, and the book is still microscopic. So he doesn't know how to work this super suit. And so you remember, if you see him flying, he's like, his limbs are falling. He's always like landing on his head, you know. And, you know, it was, it was kind of a comedy of errors, him trying to figure out how to use these superpowers, okay? Okay. Um, that book showed him exactly what he was able to do. And there was a couple episodes where the aliens would come and help him out, and he'd have it, but he'd lose it again somehow, right? So the Bible is your book of instructions 
to your super suit. It is a list of here is what you are now able to do because of the person of Jesus. So as we're reading these things, we're reading what we are now brought into. So when your neighbors are sick, the most natural thing to do is ask, can I pray for you? Okay, we're getting this audience mentality out of our heads. You're a terrorist training camp to destroy the works of the devil. Here's another lesson. Don't settle for the word incurable. There's a time to die, and believe me, when that time comes, it'll be full of peace. If you're ever with someone at their bed, you'll have peace that this is the time to let them go, okay? And, um, but apart from that, don't settle too quickly for the word incurable, okay? Don't give up after the, I'm just, I don't know a better way to say it, after the first zap, <laughs> okay? If you pray and they're not getting everything that Jesus paid for, it's okay to pray more than one time. I'm not talking about long prayers. I'm talking you are now a conduit for which the will and the life of God can flow through your heart and their, in your hands into their body. And I'll just say this. We're not a hit and run ministry. We're, we're not afraid to pray for you more than one time. I'll tell you what. Some of my heroes are people who have prayed, not seen what Jesus paid for yet, and are still coming with fresh expectation. And so for if, if you're here and you've done that, I just want to say thank you for just not giving up for drawing a line in the sand and saying, I'm not going to be moved by what I see, taste, hear, smell, or feel. I'm going to be moved by what the Word of God says. And so I tell you what, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm so proud of you guys. And uh, there has to be a place in Columbus where people are going for this stuff. Okay, I'm sure other churches are too, but uh, I just feel there's a mandate for miracles on this house. And uh, I do believe, uh, you know, you see in, in Matthew 11, Jesus is leaving a wicked city. And he says, woe to you, Corazine, woe to you, Bethsaida. If the miracles performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, those were two Old Testament wicked cities, he said they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. Miracles can turn the heart of a, of a wicked city on a dime. So one of the keys to city transformation is actually us beginning to see what Jesus paid for. Let's stand for closing prayer. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would shed abroad the love of gar God. <laughs> guard our hearts, Lord, in the love of God uh, by the Holy Spirit. Shed it abroad afresh in my heart. Just pray that, brother. God, give, shed the love of God fresh in my heart through the Holy Spirit. I pray for a fresh encounter with the love of God, Lord, that would just heal any orphan spirit that makes you feel like you're distant from God. God there, guys, there is no distance and no separation. Any distance between you, God, any separation between you and God is a facade. It's a lie. So I just pray for a fresh encounter of the Holy Spirit, even online, even on replay, that, uh, that Lord, there's a fresh touch from you, that we know your nearness, we know your attentiveness to us, we know your love. And, Lord, I pray you would just fill us with that until all fear is gone and we can receive your words, be made whole. Lord, I thank you that incurable is not a label that we give our heart to. Lord, it's just, a, it's just a stepping stone to bigger glory for you. So Lord, anyone who's in here who has an incurable disease, we just hear the words of Jesus afresh, I am willing, be made whole. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you're here and you need some extra prayer, our teams will be, uh, well, hey, uh, our teams will be, uh, got me thrown off now. Our teams will be the ones with tags on. They would uh, love to pray for you for healing. And um, yeah, thanks, thanks for keeping it fresh. And if anyone's new here, I'd love to meet you in the, uh, by the I'm New uh, banner over there. And so God bless you guys, and um, see you next week.